Actually, our mission is very simple. Love God, love people, and make disciples. Well, I'm going to talk to you today about some things. Amen. And we've, we've had uh, some, some good sermons over the last few weeks. And I don't even know if, if Pastor realizes this, but we've kind of stumbled into an accidental series. I'm calling it accidental on our part, but it's, nothing is accidental by God. Because a few weeks ago, uh, Brother Art came up here and he was talking about sound doctrine. And he was encouraging us to dig into our word more. To understand what God has really said versus what we think he said or what somebody told us that he said, but what he actually said. So we can write that on our hearts and know the God that we worship. Do we understand that? So he came with that. And the following week, Pastor came with the help and he was talking about prayer. There was a call for deeper prayer. So let's, let's, let's look at it. First doctrine, then prayer. God is setting up some stuff here. He's saying, listen, you need to know me better. You need to get in my word more. And then you better start praying more because I'm getting ready to do something. And so then the very next week, pastor came in with ready, set, go. There's a, there's a progression here. We didn't plan it. We didn't discuss it. There's a progression here. But here's, here's the great thing about God. He came in with ready, set, go, but he only talked about ready. I don't consider that an accident, Pastor. I don't consider it an accident by any means because I believe that we all want to go. Is anybody in the house don't want to go? Does anybody don't want to go? Hear the question before you raise your hand <laughs> because I hope it ain't you because we in trouble if it is. We all want to go, right? And we may be even set in our own minds to go, but what we need to spend the time is in the ready because there's many times that we go before we're ready and then we start messing stuff up. There's a whole lot of folks that go before they're ready and God says, listen, I don't want you to miss what I'm getting ready to do. So spend your time in the ready so that you can be ready. Somebody say be ready. So here's what God started to deposit in me. And let, let, me, let, me, let me tell you something. God started giving me this message two months ago before we heard any of these sermons. And so when God paused him in the ready, he sent me with what I'm going to call a, a, a public service announcement. Because here's what I heard the Spirit of the Lord say to me in the last two weeks. He says, I am getting ready to cause a shifting both corporately and individually. Now, we have to understand what a shift in God means. What it means is whatever direction you were moving in and whatever destination you were headed towards, he's getting ready to redirect something because he's got something specific for you to do. So anytime God says, I'm about to shift something, that means he's looking at you specifically saying, I've got some place for you to go. I've got something for you to do. Some people in here may already be sensing your personal shift. You may be in a season of struggle of many kinds. And that may be part of your shift. But there are some other people in here that may be sitting on your mountaintop and you're at, you're at your, your highest of heights. But no matter where you are in between the two and your lowest of lows, your highest of highs, the Lord said, I am getting ready to send a shift into the house, both corporately and individually. See, we can't separate those two things because there's no way for us as a house to grow deeper if the people don't come deeper. We understand that, right? So God is calling you deeper individually so that we might go deeper corporately. We, we see the connection? See, that this house can't be blessed greater unless the people in the house are blessed greater. We, do we see that? So, so typically, when we talk about a shift in the church, that's, that's something that Christian people like to get happy about. We like to shout, your change is coming. 
Your shift is coming, and we get happy, and we get excited because we are excited about the possibility of better than what we have. We are excited when what we see in front of us is only better than what we see presently. Now, what we have to understand is ultimately you will see better. That does not mean that everything that you walk through is going to feel better. Do we understand that? So let me, let, me, let me give you what I'm calling the principles of a shift so we can really understand what this looks like. Each and every one of us are an entity in motion, meaning time is always moving. We are always moving. Even when we're standing still, we are always moving because God is always moving. Either we are walking in obedience and moving with God, we are walking in disobedience and moving away from God, or we are standing still and we're getting left behind. But in the sequence of time, we are still moving. Are we following me on that? So if something is moving and you want to shift its trajectory, that is going to require some application of an outward force or an outward pressure. So let me explain it. If God says I'm about to shift you, we cannot think that that shift is going to come without some application of outward pressure. Where we mess up is that as soon as we start to feel the pressure, we start to resist the shift. Does anybody really want to be shifted in God today? Wave at me if you do, because I need to know who I'm talking to this morning. For all of you that want to be shifted, we have to understand that there is going to be some kind of application of an outward pressure in order to move your trajectory. Are we following me on this? We get excited about shifts. We get excited about breakthroughs. God, send my breakthrough. Send my breakthrough. I'm ready for my breakthrough. And we don't even listen to the word a lot. Break through. Lucinda, do me a favor real quick. Go open that door. Okay. Now come on this side. No, this side. This side. Yeah. Oh, yeah, hold it open, please. Yeah. Okay. Now, wait, stay there. Now, I want you to walk through that doorway. Okay, now walk back through. Okay, Lucinda, now close that door. Okay, Lucinda, now break through that door. You see your hesitation? That, that's what we do. We pray for breakthrough. We pray for breakthrough, and God says, okay, I will give you a breakthrough, but you're going to need some tools, and you're going to have to do some work. And we say, ooh, work? I want to walk through. I want to pass through. I want to, I, want to, I want to float through. And God says, listen, listen, I, you, you can't do that because in order to get where I am calling you to go, you're going to have to have some tools and some resources to tap into, not only so you can break through this next level, but so you can break through the next level and the next level and the next level. And everything that you break through is going to give you some new tools and some new resources for the next level. Are we following that? So when we pray for a breakthrough, I need you to understand what we're praying for, and what comes with that automatically. Are we together here? So this is what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about the shift. Is my, is my panel up there? Can we throw that up? Just the panel, not, not the video yet, just the panel. The more you know. Does anybody remember this? Does it look familiar to anybody? See, I put this up there. I thought this was really clever when Liliana made it. I'm like, oh, yeah, everybody's going to know what that is. And then Liliana texted me. She said, I, I didn't know that was, that was a thing. So then I felt dumb, and I can't assume that everybody has my childhood. Who remembers these commercials? Okay, most of y'all. That's not enough hands for me. So I brought a commercial with me so we could all be on the same page. Could you play that commercial for me, please? Before I was old enough to date, I'd already experienced a dozen glorious romances. I also had known the terror of going down with the Titanic, the triumph of the little engine that could, and the thrill of solving a case with Sherlock Holmes. Reading was my passion. Still is. You see, the more you read, the more you know. The better you do in school, the better you do in life. That's a promise. The more you know. See, Betty was preaching, y'all don't even know. She said, the more you read, the more you know. The better you do in school, the better you do in life. Now, 
they made a lot of these commercials. I don't, they were on from the 80s through the 90s. I don't, I don't really know how long. But the, the reason they put those on there is because uh, they would use some celebrity to, to, to talk to the community about some general information that, that applies, whether it be literacy or, or drugs or safe sex teenagers or, you know, or no sex teenagers, amen? Or, you know, <laughs> you know it, it's some, some kind of topic. And, and for most of us, for any kind of reasonable person, it's usually talking about things that we might consider common sense. But the reason why there's a need for commercials because there are some people in the world that although they should know something, they live their life like they don't know something. So we had to make commercials to, to remind some people about some principles that they should know. So what I came today to talk to you about is some principles that this community should know. So we can get to a place where we don't live our lives like we don't know it. Are we following me here? And the reason why this is so important, because when the Lord said to me, now, this was two months ago when he said it to me, not necessarily to you all. He said, not even that there was about to be a shift. I, I heard a sermon. It was July 17th. I remember it was July 17th. And I don't even remember what the guy was talking about. But he, in that sermon, he said, sometimes you need to know a thing. And that stuck with me. And it began to resonate. And then I heard the Lord say, you're going to need to know something. He gave me no context. He gave me no scripture. He didn't tell me what it was I was going to need to know. And I didn't realize at the time, but three days before that, I had had my first fever, the first fever that led to my recent hospitalization. And so the Lord said, you're going to need to know something. I said, okay. And then over the next three weeks, he began to give me the four points that I'm going to give you all today. But at that time, it was just for me. Now, he, again, no context, nothing behind it. And, and, and I realize now that that was because I wasn't going to be able to study my way into this understanding. I was going to have to live my way to get this understanding. And God did it this way so that I could come to you today and say, hey, listen, I'm about to give you some points, but you ain't going to be able to study your way. You're going to have to live your way. So when God says, I'm getting ready to shift some things in your life, you can understand, amen, Lord, I'm ready to receive that shift. But I also understand that I'm about to live my way through some things, and I'm going to need some resources to do it. Right, Lucinda? We need some tools to break through. Are we together here? So when God said, you're going you're gonna to need to know something, I... I, I'm a guy of words. If you've heard me speak before, I always have some kind of word study. I like to talk about Hebrew. I like to talk about Greek. I tell my wife all the time, words mean things because she says things to me that don't mean what she thinks they mean. So then when I understand it the way I understand it, somehow it's my fault when I'm wrong. <laughs> but words mean things. Amen. <laughs> Amen. I know, right? So when God said to me, you're going to need to know something, the first thing I did is I, as I wanted to find out what that meant. So I looked up the word no. Before I go anywhere else, I don't know if everybody in here is, is a note taker or not, but I highly encourage you to be a note taker today because what I'm about to give you is not just a Sunday sermon. I don't, I don't call myself a prophet. I don't, I, don't, I don't do those things, but I, I, this, here's what I'm telling you. What I'm about to tell you is both prophetic and propellant, because if you can take these resources and apply it to your life, it is going to give you the fuel to move you forward. So I highly encourage you to take some notes today. And the first thing I want you to write down is the English definition of the word no. It means to be aware of through observation inquiry or information observation inquiry or information so in other words you've seen it so you know it you've asked somebody about it so they told you so now you know it or you have accumulated enough data points to where you feel confident in a uh, particular subject to where you know it you've seen it you've heard it you have information about it. And, 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 and in all reality, I'm comfortable with this definition of no. The problem is we often walk 
our faith out through this understanding of no. I have faith because I've seen it. I have faith because I've asked about it. Or I have faith because I have enough data points to, to believe it. But what if I were to say to you that God needs us to move into a place of faith where you have faith for things that you haven't seen? Amen. Where you have faith for things that you can't ask nobody about because they haven't seen it either. Where you have faith where things cannot be relegated down to data points because you need to be able to see beyond what is physically experienced. You heard my wife talk about it earlier. Faith is, is, is accepts as fact what cannot be physically experienced. So when I understood that, I had, I had to realize that there were some limitations to how I knew things. So fast forward, I find myself in the hospital and I don't know why I'm there. I've never had to, I've never had to, I've always known God as a healer, but I've never had to see him heal me in such a way. So I hadn't seen it. I couldn't ask anybody about it because the doctors didn't know what was going on. They had no information. I had no information. And it was in that moment I heard the Lord say again, you're going to need to know something. So if I don't know and you don't know and neither one of us have enough information to know something, I must not understand what God means when he says no. So after all of this, I said, okay, God, let me, let me go look deeper into this and find out what you mean when you say no. The Hebrew word for know or to know is yada, Y-A-D-A -A as a transliteration, yada. That includes the English definition of know, but it goes deeper than that. It's, it also means to recognize or to acknowledge or to be endowed with or to find or to experience or to discern, to learn, to reveal, to declare, to know with certainty and assurance, to have an intimate closeness and familiarity with something or someone. And, and so, so when God said, I'm going to need to know something, my automatic res response to him was, well, I, I, I know things. You know, I've been in school a long time. My, my entire adult life, let me tell you, I'm not bragging on myself because I'm not, but I got, I've got a bachelor's degree in political science, I've got a master's degree in business, I've got a master's degree in Christian arts, I've got a master's degree in divinity, and I'm like, I, 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 no, don't clap, don't clap, don't clap, let me tell you, because I said, my response to God when he says to me, you're going to need to know something was, I know things. <laughs> so here's what he said, no. You have information, you have intelligence, you have degrees, you have abilities, you have giftings, you have talents, you have a calling, you have an anointing, but you don't know that much. Anybody that knows me knows that hurts. That stings, because I, I, like I like to know that I know some stuff. When, when people ask me why I spent so many years in school, I can't really, you know, explain it professionally because the, the day job I do has nothing to do with any degree that I have. But I say, I have all these degrees so I can win arguments. <laughs> it gets a laugh and it stops the questions. That's, that's how I explain it. But he said, you don't know that much. And he gave me all these things that I have, but I don't know that much. And so God said, this, and this is the first point, so you can go ahead and write this down. It's not about what you have, it's about what you know. So the way he made this make sense to me is that I'm laying in a hospital bed and they said, well, you may have cancer, you may have an autoimmune deficiency, you may have, you may have, you may have, you may have, and God said to me again in a hospital bed, it's not about what you have, it's about what you know. Now, that was a completely different application for me personally, but that's what I needed to hear in that moment. So we're going to look at this point, and we're going to look at it through the life of Job. We're not, we're not going to dig deep in the text because Job is one of those books where we can't, you can't really isolate a whole lot of scripture and teach it because the whole story really gives the lesson. But we're going to kind of break this down and work our way through it because there's a lot of things we can learn from Job. And the reason being is because if you read about him, the Bible says, in fact, let's just go there. Let's go to Job 1, 1, so we can just find out who it is we're dealing with here. Let 
The Bible says, there was a man in the country of Uz named Job. He was a man of perfect integrity who feared God, turned away from evil. He had seven sons and three daughters. His estate included 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, a very large number of servants. Job was the greatest man among all of the East. We'll stop there. In the cultural context of the time, Job was essentially the top 1%. He was the richest of the richest. He was the most righteous of the righteous. He was the greatest man in all the East. And now most of us are familiar with the story, and we know that Job goes from that place to the lowest of lows. Now, what does that mean for the rest of us? What it means is through, for the majority of us in this room, we're going to find ourselves somewhere between the highest of heights as Job and the lowest of lows as Job. So anything that Job learned in his struggle, we should be able to apply to our own lives. Do we see that? Because we fall someplace in the middle, unless there's anybody in here above the top 1%. If so, see me after service and we'll talk. So what we see here in these first few chapters, excuse me, first few verses of Job is that Job has it all. He's got the money, he's got the reputation, he's got favor with God, he's got the anointing, he's got all those things. He's got it all, he's got it all, he's got it all, he's got it all, up until verse 13, Job loses it all. And then in chapter 2, Job even loses his health. Has it all, loses it all. And then the rest of that book takes us through how Job has to respond to losing it all. And this is why we have to understand it is not about what you have, but what you know. Because Job had to rely on what he knew when he started going through his season, his storms, his struggles, his difficulties, because he could no longer rely on what he had. Are we, are we following? Let me give you an, an illustration to, to help you understand why this matters. In the military or in the Marine Corps specifically, I can't really speak to any other branches because they don't do it like we do it. <laughs> in the Marine Corps, we have combat training. And when we do it, when we, do, when we get into these places, we get in a circle and we do things over and over again, 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 and over and over again. And it's not because we don't know it. It's because we have to get it so deeply ingrained in the person that we are, that we can tap into it, that we can access this information at the points of the highest pressure, at the points of the highest level of stress. Because as you know, some of you may know, some of you don't, but the more stressed out you become, the more the, the pressure mounts, the more, the more anxiety you have, the less likely you are able to tap into your memory banks and start remembering specific details. So if the understanding that we have of God and the knowledge that we have of what he says in his word is very surface, then the moment your pressure begins to mount, you're not going to be able to tap into that and you're going to resort to what's really deepest ingrained in you. So when God says you need to know something, you better make sure the thing that you know is the thing that you need. Because if you start tapping into stuff that is not what God gave you to tap into, you're going to find yourself in a sticky situation. Do you hear what I'm saying? The other thing that we have in the Marine Corps, and the Army might have it too now, it's 2019. We call it weapons of opportunity. That means we may come into a fight with the rifle we were issued. We may come into a fight with the pistol we have. We may come into the fight with our grenades. We may come into the fight with all the things that we've been training with and working with, and we know how we, what we've gotten. So we're like, I've got all my stuff. I've got my magazines. I've got all of that. But see, there may be situations where you don't have any of that. And at that point, you have to know enough to know that everything around you is a weapon of opportunity, including the weapon your enemy has. I may not have a gun, but if he has a gun, I'm going to do everything I can to take your gun. Don't, don't, don't get too religious on me. War is real. Sorry. I'm going to do everything I can to take your gun because your weapon is my opportunity. So when the enemy comes and starts to bring things that are meant to destroy you, you have to understand that if you know enough, even the weapons he brought to destroy you become your weapon of opportunity. So how does this apply to the shift? We know that a shift brings pressure. We know that. It is not a matter of 
if we will see storms. It is a matter of when we will see storms. In nature, you can tell when a season is, has changed based on the type of storms that it brings. Not in Arizona, because we don't have any seasons. But in other places, they have seasons and they have storms that come with things other than dust. When the season changes to winter, people in the east can expect blizzards. When, when, when the season changes to summer, we can expect dust and hot, 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 hot. When seasons change in other places that have plant life, they can expect rain showers. So we understand that season changes come with storms. Are we following? If it happens in nature, the nature that God created, the, the, the nature that God established and ordained, it is going to happen in the spirit because God is the same. So don't come into new seasons expecting there to be no storms. So when your storms arise, the question is, what do you know? What do you know? Because you better know something. Because there is not a person in this room, unless you're a liar, there is not a person in this room that can say, you know what, every storm I've had, I've, I've maintained my composure, and I have risen above, and I began to cite the word of the Lord to the enemy, and I, and I rolled my R's because that's how you know it's anointed. No, we don't always respond that way. Or is it just me? Is it just me? Come on. We don't always respond that way. And pressure mounts and stuff gets hot and things get, get uncomfortable and we start to react like Job. We may not curse God, but that doesn't mean we agree with him. We may not sin against God, but that doesn't mean we don't have questions for him. So how do we stand in that? We have to know something. Some of us, <laughs> some of us have been living our lives like bad McDonald's employees. See, they reacted, and they don't even know what it means yet. I had the same reaction. And this is, this, is what, this is what it means. God has been putting you on schedule for some things, but you keep missing your shifts. I'm going to say it again. God has put you on schedule for some things, but you keep missing your shifts. Why? Because pressure mounts, and we forget what we know. Pressure mounts, and we don't tap into the right stuff. Pressure mounts, and we get nervous, or, or, or we start to say, we, we start to look at what we have, well, I don't, I, I, or, or what we don't have. I don't have the ability. I don't have the courage. I don't have the experience. I don't have the age. That was one for me. I'm not, I'm not old enough. I haven't, I haven't seen enough. I don't have. I don't have. I don't have. I don't have. And God says, since when has it been about you and what you have? See, all I need is your yes. All I need is your obedience. You don't have to bring anything to the table. I'm going to give you everything that you need, but all I need is your yes. But if you become more focused on what you have than what you know, then the reality is when you try to walk this thing out, the only thing that you're going to have as a resource is what you have. And I'm telling you, you cannot fulfill the purpose of the Lord by means of what you have. So we better come to a place where we say it's not about what I have, but it's about what you have. Are, we, are you with me on this? So I have a, I have a sub point to my first point. You can call it point two. I, ha I call it point one B because it kind of goes together. One, it's not about what you have. It's about what you know. But what you also have to realize is you don't know that much. Oh, nobody said amen because y'all reacted like I did. Pfft. You don't know me. Amen. Thank you, brother. You have to realize you don't know that much. We miss our shifts when we rely solely on what we know. But you have to understand something. If we are following an omniscient God who knows all, it, you have to understand that no matter how much you know, you don't know all there is to know. Do, do we see that? You, you, you know, I, some of you may be familiar with Bishop Mitchell. He speaks here on a regular, well, every now and then. That man knows so much, so much so that I have to, like, come back and listen to it again so I have time to look up the words that he said so I can understand what he said. He, he just knows. He knows. He knows. But let me tell you something. He don't know that much. And I think he would be okay with me saying that because the last time he spoke in this house, he talked about the omniscience of God. He says, God knows all things plausible, 
all things probable and all things possible. Raise your hand if you know those things. See, y'all, y'all got to listen to the question before you answer. We see what kind of students you were. Oh, me, me, no. If you don't know those things, then you don't know that much. And it's okay because God does not want you to be the person that has to know everything. Because if you know everything, then you're going to be in a place where he becomes unnecessary. And let me tell you this. He will never allow us to exist in a place or function in in, in a realm that makes him unnecessary. So understand that you don't know that much. Pastor, Pastor has said it before. He says... Whatever you see happening in the foreground, understand that God is doing so much more in the background. Man, when he said that, that, it messed me up. It seems like common sense. It should be. But when he said it, I was like, hmm, the more you know. Whatever I see in the foreground, God is doing so much more in the background. How do we, how do we see this in Job? See, we have the benefit when we read the text, we get to see the whole picture. We see who Job was, and then we get to see a conversation that God had in the heavens. Job didn't get to see that conversation. See, it would be so much easier to go through the things that we have to go through when we're walking in obedience with God if we had the opportunity to see the conversations that he had about us in heaven first. If we got to hear God say, well, consider my servant Cedric. He is blameless. He is righteous. He is this. He is that. He is this. He is that. So go ahead and test him so I can show you how bad he is. See, if we heard that conversation, we would be able to walk into some stuff with a whole lot of confidence, understanding, yes, I know who I am, and God knows who I am. I understand that I'm only enduring this just so I can show my enemies who I am, but we don't get to hear those conversations. Job didn't get to hear that. So Job had to walk into this situation understanding that all he had was what he knew. But we don't get to know it all. Let's go to Romans 11.33. And I'm I'm, I'm doing this from the Amplified if if you're curious. And this just gives us a little snapshot into how little we know. It says, oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and decisions and how unfathomable and untraceable are his ways. This must be why we are told to lean not to our our own understanding and to trust in the Lord with all our heart. Because we don't know that much. When we have to rely on a knowledge that's not our own, and, and know it, as, you know, yada, know, to know with certainty, to know with assurance, to know without a shadow of a doubt, but this is a knowledge that's not based on our own knowledge. That sounds a whole lot like faith to me, doesn't it? Does that sound, sound about right to you? There's a connection between what you know and faith. So let's look at faith a little bit here. Go to uh, uh, Hebrews 11.6. Hebrews 11.6. This is probably a a very familiar passage to most of us. This is probably one of the passages that I I feel. It's just Stephen's opinion. You can argue with me if you want. But as Art says, I'll prove you wrong. (laughs) This might be one of those, those scriptures that the church has not always handled the best way. We haven't always taught it the best way. But let's see what it says. It says, and without faith... It is impossible to please him, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Some translations read, he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Now, we're going to unpack this a little bit because I really want us to understand what this is saying and how it relates to our faith, which is directly connected to what we know. One, diligently is not included in the original text. Diligently is something that we had to add because the word seek means automatically earnestly seeking. It means diligently seeking, which means it is impossible to seek God any other way than diligently. If you are not seeking diligently, then you are not really seeking. 
if you only come to church on Sundays and you only look for God on Sundays and not Monday through Saturday, you're probably not diligently seeking. If you only pray when you need something and not just to commune with God, then you are probably not diligently seeking because there is only one way to seek God and that is diligently. So he rewards those who seek him earnestly, diligently. But what does it mean to reward? That word that we translate as reward is actually translated from two separate words in the text. One word being mistapodotes, which means rewarder. The other word being ginomai, which means some other things, and we're going to look at that. But when you read it, you have to, you have to read it as he is a rewarder that rewards those who seek him. So let's look at what ginomai means. It's translated as rewards, but what it really means is to move to a new place or to cause to come into possession of new characteristics or to cause something to happen. The implication being that once that something has happened, the new thing is so much different from the old thing. That's what it means when God says he's going to reward you. It means he's going to move you to a new place cause you to come into new characteristics and cause something to happen in your life. So let's look at this text again, and I'm gonna I'm gonna give it to you in the double amplified version. I've I've filled this thing out based on what we've what we learned from uh, 11.1 in the definition of faith and what we learn here by looking at the words. It says, without the assurance of what is divinely guaranteed, and if we cannot accept as fact what we cannot physically experience, it is impossible to please God or to walk with him. Because in order to earnestly seek him, we must first believe that he exists. Meaning, if we're, well, maybe he's there, maybe he's not. Uh, I'm, I'm just, you know, I'm just looking for answers. Well, you're not earnestly seeking him, you're just spiritually curious. But God is looking for seekers. He's looking for seekers. I want to be a seeker like this. Because the Bible says, me, my Bible says that those who seek will find. So if we go forward in this, it says, and, and when you seek him, you will find him. And as a result, you will find yourself in a new place because you are no, uh, because you are no longer where you were, but where God is. Are we hearing that? Rewards means to move to a new place. So when we seek him the way he has designed us to seek him, then you can no longer be in the place you used to be because now you're in the place where God is. And as a result of being in the place where God is, he's going to cause you to come into some new characteristics, meaning he's going to make you look more like him. You're going to start walking like him and talking like him and thinking like him and smelling like him. I call that a reward. Does anybody else call that a reward? So then after all these things has happened, God's going to say, look at where you are now. Everything in your life is different. Let me tell you something. It is not because all those things are different. It is because you are different. And when you become different, you cause everything around you to be different. Do I have any seekers in the house today that are ready to move into a place where God causes you to be different? We've got to be ready. We've got to be ready. And so in order to be ready, in order to give an honest assessment of what we know, we have to look at how we know it. Where is our information coming from? It, it ain't always coming from the right places. There, there is an inextricable, an inseparable relationship between what you know and where your faith lies. You can't separate the two. Let me prove it to you. In Matthew chapter 8, yeah, we find the disciples on a boat in a storm. They know there's a storm. They know the wind is blowing. They know water drowns you. They know all this stuff. They also know that Jesus is on the boat. But they don't know that Jesus is on the boat. If they knew that Jesus was on the boat, they'd have less cause to be concerned about the storm. 
They'd have less cause to be concerned about impending death, impending doom. They'd have less cause for that. So instead, they focus on what they could see and what they could observe or what they could ask somebody about or what they have information about. And those become the things that we know. So then when they ran to Jesus and said, Lord, don't you care that we're about to die? His response was, you have little faith. It wasn't because they didn't know anything. It was because what they knew, what they yada, was not the right thing. Their focus was in the wrong place. They were taking in signals that began to influence what they knew, and, th and, and so they stopped knowing what they should have known. Are we following? Is that, that might have sounded confusing coming out of my mouth, but did it make sense to you? Amen. Amen. So where does our faith come from? Romans 10, 17 gives us his answer. It says, it says faith come by hearing. Y'all know this. And hearing... We have two principles here in that statement. Faith comes by hearing, principle one, and hearing by the word of God, principle two. So what this is giving us instructions on is how to, to, to build God-centered faith, Christ-centered faith. But you can build your faith on some stuff that ain't in Christ. Some of us put our faith in stuff. Some of us have faith for things. Here, get this. Some of us have faith in faith. Well, I said it, and I believe it, and I believe it's going to be done. And, blah, 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 blah. and our faith is in our faith. But if our faith isn't rooted in the right thing, so how do we know it? There's a connection between the, the, the principle of faith is based on what you hear. What you hear is going to begin to flu influence your faith. So when we look at Job... Job knew who he was, he knew what he had, he knew all of that, he knew he was blameless, he knew that, he knew that, but then all of a sudden, Job heard his oxen were dead. And then Job heard his camels were dead. And then he heard all ten of his children were dead. And then he heard all of his, all of his servants were dead. And then he even heard from his own wife, why don't you just curse God and die? Job began to hear all sorts of things. And even though it did not cause him to step away from God altogether, it certainly began to impact his focus. It began to shift what he knew. And then, and then if we look at chapters 4 through 31, which is the bulk of, of, the, of the text, Job heard from three people, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. Now, we're not going to go and take a deep dive into what they said. Y'all can do that on your own time. But, but, but we are going to look at what they represent. Eliphaz means God dispenses judgment. Eliphaz is the, is the, most, the most gentle of the three friends. He, he, he is the theologian. He's the one that looks at uh, um, observations and experiences about God in order to make certain conclusions about God. And so when he comes to, to Job, he says, well, you know, God is just and God is righteous and God is this. So because you're going through what you're going through, it must be because you are not those things. That's what Eliphaz brings. We may not have friends like Eliphaz in our outer circle, but we definitely have some Eliphaz on the inside of us. We definitely go through some times where we say, well, God is good and God is good and God is good. But because my situation is bad, it must mean I am bad. And, and, and we are. But we have to understand that God doesn't rule that way. He doesn't function that way. But when we're going through and the pressure begins to mount, we forget that God doesn't rule that way. And our Eliphaz begins to speak to us. And it's like, well, yeah, I, I mean, I guess I'm just... Mm -hmm. That's, that's the spirit of you, or well, oh yeah. The, the other friend is, is Bildad, and his name means son of contention, or, or in other words, it means a seed of dispute or, or disagreement. You, 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 know, you ever know anybody who, 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 who you can argue with, and no matter how right you are, no matter how wrong they are, they can make you feel wrong? Be quiet. You ever, you ever have a conversation with somebody that no matter what you say, they've got a disagreement for it, even if what you're saying is correct? You ever have anything in yourself that begins to say, you know, I am the righteousness of God. I have the promises of God. Everything in God is yes and amen. And then as soon as you say it, some says, well, yeah, but you. Let me, let, me give you let me give you a moment of transparency here. As I prepared this message, I would hear the Spirit of God say something, and I'd, ooh, I'd get excited, and I'd start pacing my house, and I'd start preaching it, and I'd say, ooh, that's good, that's good, that's real good. And two minutes later, I'd be like, I don't think that was the Lord, that was probably me. 
I'm just a good writer. I'm just real creative. <laughs> I'm serious. I'm serious. I spend days fasting and saying, God, only you, only you, only you, only you, only you, only you. And, and, and that's what I want. But in all reality, the reason, the motivation behind that prayer is because I couldn't get a handle on the fact that this is you. And I couldn't check my bill dad in that moment to, that, that just had to disagree with everything and, and cancel out what God was saying. And sometimes that is the thing that gets us jacked up. Things that we know to be true, but because we keep disagreeing with ourselves, because we keep hearing some other influences, it starts to refocus our faith. And the last friend is, is Zophar. He's the mean one. He's the rough one, actually. His name means rough. His name means doubtful. His name also means chirper. He, he's, the one, he's the one that's just nagging at you. You ain't, you ain't got it. You, you ain't good enough. You don't have this. You don't have that. See, so all three of these people are bringing the same kind of things to Job. All three are attacking his, his righteousness. All three are attacking the same kind of stuff in, in um, escalating tones. And it doesn't cause him to sin against God, but, it, but his defense against what he's hearing is so intense that his focus shifts now to his righteousness. Not to the righteousness of God, but to his own righteousness. So then the argument he begins to make is yes not not your will God but why are you doing this to me I am righteous I am blameless I won't sin against you but I got some questions this this process this this thing let me let, let, let me let me be honest with you these these questions these things that we are hearing that that get us all off course this these are the, this is the reason why we see suicide in the church still this is the reason why we see pastors that should know something killing themselves. And I don't say that to diminish anything that they're dealing with in terms of mental health or anything like that. But, but, but listen, the enemy is targeting you. We understand that, right? And if he can get you to believe some things that are not the truth, he can get you to refocus your stuff and not only uh, forfeit your purpose and your destiny, but to the extreme of forfeiting your life. People of God, we've got to get this together and we've got to check what we're hearing. This is why Proverbs 2, you can go there if you want. If not, I'll just read it to you. Proverbs 2 says, my, my 2, 1 through 5, My son, if you receive my words and treasure up my commandments with you, making your ear attentive to wisdom and inclining your heart to understanding, yes, if you call out for insight and raise your voice for understanding, if you seek it like silver and search for it as hidden treasures, then you will, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find knowledge of God. We've got to... Be attentive to what we're hearing because that is going to influence what we know. And what we know is going to influence where our faith lies. And that's going to determine how we come through our seasons of pressure. Are we, are we hearing this? So when we look at that, when we look at the friends that, that Job had, when we look at the, the circle around him and who was speaking and who he was hearing and, and, and where his focus wasn't, it, it raised point three. Sometimes it's not about what you know. Sometimes it's not just about how you know it, but it is always about who you know. Write it down. Who you know. See, Job's problem is that he was seeking answers more than he was seeking wisdom. He was seeking explanation from God more than he was seeking God himself. We can't, we can't pursue knowledge solely for the sake of knowledge. We have to pursue God in order, that, in order to gain knowledge, in order to be effective in purpose. Are we hearing that? Pursue God so that we can gain knowledge to be effective in purpose. Job understands this later on in the text. In, 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 in uh, chapter 28, he says, but God understands the way to wisdom. He knows its location. He looks to the ends of the earth and sees everything under the heavens. When God fixed the weight of the wind and limited the water by measure, when he established a limit for the rain and a path for the lightning, he considered wisdom and evaluated it. He established it and examined it. He said to mankind, look, fear the Lord. That is wisdom. The fear of the Lord has to be the basis of what you know. The funny thing 
about all of this is that Job asks a lot of questions. Well, why me, God? Why me, God? Why me, God? A whole lot of questions are raised in the text itself. Is God just? Does he rule by justice? All this kind of stuff. But God never answers any of those questions. He gives no explanation. He gives, he, gives, he gives nothing. He gives nothing. What he does is he answers a question with a question. He says, basically, to sum it up, you better check yourself before you wreck yourself. I don't know if people still say that. Do people still say that, son? Whatever. I say it. And that, and that starts in chapter 38. And, and, and for the next four chapters, God essentially just kind of rips into him. Were you there when? Who are you to give me? What, what do you know about when I did? I, he, and he does this for four chapters. Now, it is not to diminish Job. It's not to jack him up. What it is to say is, um, you are looking at the wrong thing. Stop asking me why and just say yes. Stop asking me why and just trust me. See, that's where we mess up because stuff starts to happen in our lives and we want to know why. We start to hit God with all these interrogatives. Well, why am I going through this? And how are you going to fix it? And when am I going to come out of it? And how long am I going to have to endure it? And God says, were you there when... Do you, did you see the conversation I had about you before you came to this point? See, see, what Job failed to understand is that God didn't put him in this situation to punish him. God put him in this situation because he had overwhelming confidence that Job had the ability to stand in the midst of it. But because his perspective was off, he thought God was just dumping on his head and God is really elevating him in front of his enemies we've got to understand that our perspective is not God's his ways are higher than our ways his thoughts are higher than our thoughts and until we get the mind of Christ we've got to know God we've got to seek him I love, I, love the way, I love the way Paul puts it uh, in, in Philippians chapter 3. And we're going to read this because it's good. Put that up if you can. Philippians chapter 3, um, starting in, I'm going to start in verse 4. He says, he says and, I, and I like this because a lot of the things that, that, that he says here sounds a lot like Job. It sounds a lot like the same situation. And it says, though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more circumcised on the eighth day of, of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, a Hebrew of Hebrews, top of his game, top of his class. In the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless, like Job. But Paul's perspective is different. He says, but whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I might gain Christ and be found in him. Not having righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness of God that depends on faith that I may know him yeah. and the power of his resurrection. And may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means I may attain the resurrection from the dead. When we know something and we know the reliability of the source, because we know the God that said it, it brings us to my fourth point. Know enough to know what you don't need to know. Amen. Write it down. Know enough to know what you don't need to know. Basically, what I'm saying is stop demanding details before you're willing to act in obedience. If God gives you a path, don't demand the mountaintop. If God shows you the mountaintop, don't demand to see the path. Now, I'll be honest with you. I struggle with this. I do. It's, 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 it's the Marine in me. I like a good operations order. I like the commanding officer to sit me down and say, okay, here is your SMEAC, if you don't know what that is. SMEAC, SMEAC, situation, mission, execution, admin, logistics, command, and signal. 
What that means is situation. Here's what's going on currently in your life, in the surrounding areas. Here's your situation. Mission. This is what I'm telling you to do. This is what, what your, your, your objective is. Execution. This is how you're going to do it. Admin and logistics. Here's everything that you're going to need to do it. Here's point B. Here's your beans, bullets, and band-aids. This is everything that you need. Command and signal. It means this is who is in charge. This is who you go to in case of this. This is how you signal and da 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 And lastly, what is the, this is the commander's intent. That means this is what I need to happen no matter what. And then I can take that all of that information, and then I can go to my people and say, here is your SMEAC, and then I get everything, and they get everything, and everybody is happy, and we all know what we're doing. Unfortunately, God says, nope. I'll give you a situation. You know your situation. I'm going to give you a mission. Here's your mission. And all you're going to get beyond that is the commander's intent. I'm going to let you know what I expect to see happen. I'm not going to tell you where you got to go to do it. I'm not going to tell you what you've got to go through to see it. I'm not going to tell you what all you're going to need to do it. Come on, somebody. This is why we have problems, because we can't step into this situation and say, God, I don't need to know everything. I don't need to know every lesson I'm going to have to learn. All I need to know is who issued the order. All I need to know is my commander's intent, and then I should be able to move from there. This is why we have to stay in the ready, because God says, I need you to be ready. I need you to be ready to move when I say move. Stop asking me questions. Come into a place where you don't need to know why. You don't need to know how. You just need to know who sent you. Abram, come out of your father's house into a land that I will show you. Leave your place of comfort into a place that I will show you. That's uncomfortable. That's uncomfortable. The thing that comforts me in that is this. Psalms 37, 23, and I'm going to do it in the King James. Pastor went to King James last week. I'm going to go to this week. Well, I'll give you ESV first. It says, <laughs> it says, ESV says, the steps of a man are established by God. King James Version says, the steps of a good man are ordered by God. Now, that word ordered means established. It means arranged. It means governed. It means placed with intention. It means ordered. So my steps are, are ordered. See, he doesn't say your destination is ordered. It is. But he needs your perspective to be right. He doesn't need you looking at the end. He needs you looking at the next step. Here is your next step. Here is your next step. Your steps are ordered. Somebody's next step is dependent on obedience. Let me tell you something. Your next step depends on your obedience. So when God says your steps are ordered, understand this one is established. This one is established. That one is established. No matter where it goes, it's established. No matter where it leads me, it's established. No matter what storms I face, it's established. This is why I can say, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because my steps are ordered. Do you hear me? Now, I'm a Marine, and so when I hear that something is ordered, it means something different to me. I realize, for all you theologians in the room, that the Hebrew word used here does not mean ordered in this way. But if somebody tells me that something has been ordered, the way I hear it is, is that it's been commanded. So then when, when God wants us to get into a place where he says your steps have not only been established, but they've also been commanded. If we can live our lives in that place, then when God says go, we don't hear it as a suggestion. We hear it as a command because that's what obedience looks like. So I can take steps in obedience, understanding that they've been established. I can take steps in obedience because God says so, understanding that he's already walked it out. If we understand that, where can we not go? What can we not do? Listen, people of God, a shift is coming. A shift is coming. We have got to be ready. Is anybody ready to be ready? Is anybody ready to be shifted? 
If it ain't you, then I'm not talking to you. But if it is you, be ready. Be ready. Be ready. 